So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Reem and I go by Vipassamama and today I am having a pretty unique call. It's going to be our, our first time coming together as um, just a collective and really discussing intersexual dynamics uh, from a feminine perspective. So uh, as I said, I go by Vipassamama on uh, Instagram and all my social media platforms. And uh, I'm an osteopath, a radical birth keeper, and a trauma coach. I met these women that you're going to hear from today through the Bruja Report. Uh, shout out to Everest Asher and her underground coven. Um, and, you know, we, we clicked and I had the pleasure of really getting to know uh, Mackenzie, Ellen, and Vanya through our um, program Divine Union. And so uh, if you're unfamiliar, I am in my launch right now for Divine Union, and it is a way of deprogramming and dispelling your um, pop culture programming, if you will. So we have all been a little bit under uh, the spell like Sleeping Beauty of Disney, of the mainstream media, of big pharma and the medical industry, and even feminism. Even the people that say that they're fighting for the rights of women and equality, there's been some really subtle uh, discrepancies that I have been uh, awakening to. And I don't claim to be awake to all of the lies of the world, but I've definitely shaken myself out of this uh, comfortable bubble that I was living in for a long time. And so Divine Union came as a, a way to be in the most radical resistance. And to me, the clear answer for that was to exist in love and to create union in our homes, in our hearts, with the people that are closest to us, and even to create union with those that we don't necessarily agree with. Um, and I think that is probably the most challenging thing in times like these, because we're seeing how even a difference of opinion can be polarizing and that we don't want to navigate, we don't want to interact. And we're just, we're part of this cancel culture now. And I'm just really wondering what kind of narrative that feeds, what kind of people does that foster and, and does that help us to develop and grow into? And so, uh, Without any further ado, I want to just give a chance to each one of my incredible women that have taken Divine Union. You'll get to hear from them about their experience, their perspective. And again, if you have not checked out the Divine Union uh, offer page, link in my bio. Uh, we are in launch until Valentine's Day. So there is not a better time for you to tap into this um, and to cultivate Divine Union in your life and really make something that lasts you not just on one consumer holiday, but the entire year and for all of eternity, at least until you're passing on into another realm, I guess. So, so we'll go ahead and we'll start with Mackenzie, if you just go ahead and introduce yourself for the audience. Hello, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Dahl, and I live here in Austin, Texas. And like Reem said, I've met all of these lovely women, uh, mostly through Divine Union, through Reem, but like we didn't know each other um, on Bruja as much. <clears throat> Happy to be here and I'm um, really excited to see how this talk unfolds for you ladies. And of course we have Ellen. Hi everyone, I'm Ellen. Um, I live here in Chicago. Um, yeah, met these amazing women earlier this year. Very, very grateful for the knowledge that I've learned from all of them, especially Divine Union um, and how it's applied to me in my intimate rom romantic relationship and to creating the life that I ultimately want to build. So I'm excited to share more of that insight with all of you. And Vanya. Vanya and I have known each other. Vanya did my program, Creation Pelvic Redemption, and we did wheels together. So that was, um, we've gotten to do a lot together. So it's been pretty exciting. Vanya, go ahead. Yes. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Vanya. I'm from Italy, and I'm the weirdo of English, of course. And it's a journey. It's, it was a, a really amazing journey for me 
and the first time that I really felt connected with women all about the world and I'm so happy to be here. So I'll be announcing later. And again, if you're on Instagram watching this live, come join us in the Zoom room where all the action's happening. And um, yeah, this is going to be the first of many conversations. So we'll talk about that at the end. But for today, we're going to get into seven deadly sins. Do you believe in sin? Or is sin just one of those spells of the patriarchy to keep us oppressed as women? And I would love to just open the floor for any ladies and hear what your thoughts are, you know? Rim, We've all we been are, a little bit oppressed in our life. Rim, we are Italian. We grew up with sins. So for us, it's like our daily milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Like, um, I, for me, like beliefs, believing in something has to come from my own direct experience with it. And um, I can think back to countless times as like an innocent child in which sin, sin is embedded into our like nature. So I'm very familiar with it. I actually was thinking about this last night and cause we'd been discussing in our small group and seeing your emails of like seven deadly sins and relationships, da, 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 da. And it just kind of hit me last night of like, oh shit, like, sin is a thing. Like I feel like it was like a thing in like Sunday school, which I hated going to and told my mom I wasn't going to church anymore when I was in fifth grade. And then I just realized I was like, sin is any act against like God, you know? And like what I believe God to be, it would be like any act against like intuition, any act against love, any act against those things that are not in the interest of all of that. And I just like had this moment last night of like, holy shit, like I do wrong, <laughs> which is uh, a lot of what divine union is, is realizing where to take responsibility for yourself. So I think sin is real. And I don't think it's something that um, most people want to believe is real and definitely not believe that it applies to yourself. I definitely went through a phase in like probably right after high school, those college years um, where I just, I honestly felt like sin wasn't real and that it was like an artificial construct that was placed on culture and society to like instill us, to force us to be moral human beings. Like I, I completely like wrote it off. Um, so it's interesting how you come full, full circle. Back what I, what I love about this conversation and Ellen, you kind of brought up God and like thinking about like, just like wondering, like, watching people's faces when you even say certain words so when you say words like god or sin and watching the expression and what kind of like surfaces in that moment is always really interesting for me but ultimately um this idea of sin and whether or not it exists and how it lands for us has actually created a sense of rebellion wouldn't you say because how do you create, how do you in, ignite the initiative for an individual to rebel? You know, it's a fun thing to think about. Wouldn't boundaries, any kind of boundary would, would allow you to kind of repel against the boundary or like to like work, work with that? How do you play with that? And so do you think that rebellion is like resistance, like I said, you know, we hear people talking about peaceful resistance. We hear like feminists maybe talking about radical resistance and is resistance itself a program or is that normal human behavior? Mm. I went through the rebellion phase pretty hard. Um, and that like when I'm thinking about it in terms of sin, like it actually lines up with um, whether or not I held God inside of me or not, or whether or not I, I even, I totally became atheist for a while. Um, and then at that time, that's when I'm like, sin isn't real. Nothing is a coincidence. Like everything or everything is a coincidence. Like nothing has a purpose or a reason. And I think when you're like living out of that, it's really easy 
to think that the opposite of these guidelines or these um, these like cornerstone, like this is how you should be living your life out of, to take the opposite and be like, I'm gonna do the exact opposite is that act of rebellion. And I've really been looking at my own act of rebellion and trying to figure out where that came from. And so this makes total sense. <laughs> I think there is something to, on like a developmental level, the needing to step out of like what you were raised in to a certain extent, like define your own identity. Who are you as an autonomous individual? Um, and that like we know happens around teenage young adulthood of like, who am I? Um, but I think the way that we are taught to rebel currently is all advertising. I mean, basically in the fifties, like, and especially with the baby boomer generation, they invented like teenagehood, like go be a cool teenager and do all this stuff. Like that wasn't a, a market before that for like people to sell things to that gen, like that age of people that that wasn't a thing. And so then they realized they could like sell teens on a bunch of stuff and they're like formed like teenage rebellion. And then there's the sixties. And I mean, I was like totally into that. I love the sixties, you know, it's fun. But in reflecting on like my rebellion phase, which was like, you know, drugs, rock and roll the whole way, it was straight from a movie, straight from a movie. I was like, I want to be Penny Lane and I want to be um, the, the chicken across the universe. Like, I want to be these chicks in these like 60s, 70s rock and roll movies, you know, and just like do acid and do all of that. And so none of it's actually original. None of it's actually like me figuring out who I truly am as an autonomous individual beyond like my parents. Um, it was sold to me. And in that time, like, I think that's also when I, I was an atheist, I was doing acid and was like, there's some, there's, we're all connected, but I definitely couldn't say the word God. And I definitely didn't think there was anything wrong with like how I'll tie in a deadly sin here with how like gluttonous I was being, um, but when, and when I look back, it's like, I don't guilt myself for it. And also I would be more discerning and I would teach like my daughter to be more discerning of those things, so. I've never been through the rebellion phase actually. So I was raised Catholic and I was like working in the church, like raising the little kid and I was 15 years old. I just get a little bit upset because Someone was telling me that I was dressing short too short. And then I moved out from the church and then I spent all my life searching for God in any place. Like I went to India, I lived there, but God is part of my life. And yes, I was jealous about the girl having this rebellion phase, cutting their hair, blue hair, like she is there. And I was like, oh, maybe I should do like that. But there is something inside of me that is like, too much good girl, you know, <laughs> but I'm missing that phase. Mm -hmm. I've never been a punk. Mm -hmm. I wish I had. Mm. So Vanya, like, I wonder if like, I wonder if it's part of the Western civilization or do you feel like because you're in Europe, it's still present there? Like to, to want to rebel in Italy? I think that in Italy we feel a lot, you know, this, the church is here, the Pope is here. So my generation grew up in this kind of environment that was very healthy in a way because we grew up with many kids around and with family. It was a lovely surrounding, but then, then you start to grow up and then you, you want to express yourself, you want to become a woman and, you know, they try to keep you down and then you start to change. But here, I think we have this feeling very strong and the sense of guilt in Italy is deeply rooted in us. Yes, a lot. So much interesting stuff that you said there, because, you know, even as you're saying, like, I kind of wish I had my rebellion phase. I wonder if that's your hypergamy talking and like thinking that the grass is greener on the other side. Probably. And then Ellen, you were saying, and then, and you said that the guilt was really rooted deep, but you too, Ellen, you were saying how, when you went through that rebellion phase, do you think that it was, so you don't think that it was like 
your doing? You thought it was like maybe through the movies or through the programming or, and did it feel like when, when you hear something, when someone tells you something, what happens inside of your body? Like, are you like, I have to rebel? Like, or are you like, no, I, I agree with what they're saying. And do you like try to reason it out? Like what was going on for me then? Yeah. Or I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, or like if, ha- if your process has changed at all, like you can talk about if the process has changed. Or if there's something that like I disagree with and frustrates me, is it like I have to rebel against that? I would say yeah. now it's, I'm in the process of working on it being more of like a discerning critical discussion with myself or the other person. <laughs> this ties in with relationships. Cause, um, like with my boyfriend, he'll tell me like, here, do this thing. That's going to be a lot healthier for you. You're going to feel a lot better. And my instant instinct at him telling me what to do is like, you can't tell me what to do. And that rebellion attitude, fuck you, patriarchy, like parents don't tell me what to do thing comes up. And so like, I'm in a process right now of really working on like, okay, thank you for that suggestion. Um, I am open to integrating that right now. I'll like, let me sit on it and like, think about how that would look in my life. Like, you know, like making it more of a discussion and less of a like, fuck you, like get away. And I don't like, you can't tell me what to do, which is definitely what the attitude was for me previously. Um, And I think that like that attitude was definitely there as a teenager, especially like with my mom. And then in college age, I was like dry dropped in and out of college. But in that time, it was like justified by all the social justice movements that were happening around me and um, that I felt like I had to be a part of in order to be like a good person. It was like, well, I can just say fuck you to anything that like I don't like. Mm-hmm. So you you both, a few of you guys said the same thing. So I just, I want to like, just check in. Is it the patriarchy that oppresses women? What actually oppresses women? Is it the patriarchy? Not in my experience. Like in my experience, it was directly like religion. You ladies, do you find that, that, that? lands the same for you or differently or who oppresses women i feel more my feeling since time long time and this is something that really connect me me to you is that i'm missing information information from women so it's not the man it doesn't come from men it comes from a lack of information from Mm -hmm. women to women this is my feeling Mm -hmm. i'm trying to really get at like how I've felt oppressed and what were those forces. And I don't want to say this as like a blanket statement of truth. I think there's more nuance behind it. And also like, I wasn't raised with really any male figures in my life, but I, when I think about my life, I actually feel more oppressed by the women in my life, like on Mm. an individual level. I know there's systems behind that, like, that could be talked about. So like in my family, it was like, you, everything has to be just fine. You can't be too out there. You can't be too whatever. Everything has to be just fine. My mom is like, so intuitive, so cool, so creative. And she was like, she had to like shut all that down and she didn't want me to have to shut it all down, but in her shutting it down for herself, it was like hard for me to access that for myself as well, growing up. Um, And I don't know what those other forces are at play maybe like it it, like I wasn't raised super religious but like generations before me I know were so maybe it was the the religion with that but it was definitely more like the women telling the women in my family like you can't be a certain way Mm. it's very interesting because in the Middle East like do you know who like why why the women all are wearing like the burqas and the hijabs like it's not because of the men. Men would love to look at other women. It's because the other women are saying, no, 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 I don't want you looking at any other women. And so I want the women covered up. And those are the people that maintain the laws. And so what you're all reflecting is a little bit of 
uh, what's called female competition anxiety. It's a concept we learn about in divine union and understanding how there's, and at different stages in your life, you're going to feel like females are your competition. But again, this is about developing sisterhood and how to override the innate biology and our normal physiolo uh, psycho psychology, physiology, and neurology. And um, I just, I want to, I want to address this because I think it's really important that we get this clear. So when we say that religion oppresses us, is it really, well, is it the patriarchy? Is it religion? Like I've been on this search and trying to understand who is actually oppressing women. And I think if you study like pickup artists and guys that like spin plates or like spit game, one of their rules is to find out what women want to hear and then tell them what they want to hear. And so now take that principle and apply it in the world of self-development, coaching, um, the female like leadership world. And what ends up happening is that a lot of the messages that we women are receiving are things that we want to hear because we end up wanting to pay women to tell us what we want to hear. Because it sounds good, like manifesting, um, like follow your desire, all of these teachings that like, well, th that sounds really good. And I think it, I think that's like the, the way of the moving forward. But, and one of the spells that I believe that we're under is that smash the patriarchy. The patriarchy is what oppresses us. Religion is what oppresses us. So break it down. Okay, let's say let's say there are men that do oppress women. There are men that do oppress women. There are men that hurt women, that rape women, that kill women, 100%. Is that man a real man? Is that man a representation of the masculine? If I think about like the patriarchy, the patriarchy and the matriarchy are both like, divine forces and so to label an entire group of like the opposite sex which is supposed to be our counterpart which is the, supposed to be the the people that we can make peace with so we can have harmony on the earth so we can procreate and continue life and ultimately if you do anything to interject in that process then you are standing in the way of life continuing on earth period that's undeniable because this dance has been happening for centuries. That's how babies are born. And unless we're going to start having babies in test tubes, which is a very high possibility at this point in the game, we need to really assess like what has brought us to here, what has worked and what has not worked. And so um, these men that hurt women are not alpha males. They're not even beta males, they're gammas, you know? And the sociosexual hierarchy, although it is neutral to women, it has nothing to do with women. It's totally defined on how men organize themselves in um, a situation where they're, they have, like, let's say you, you have a hundred men in the forest, you, you leave them in the forest and they gotta like work together. So naturally, one of them is going to pick up the slack and say, hey, I will, I will take responsibility for the team. And if we succeed, it's on my shoulders. And if we don't succeed, it's also on my shoulders. And then there's going to be a guy who says, yeah, I want to be second in command. I don't want to take the full responsibility, but I'll follow your lead. And I'll, I'll be loyal to you and I'll do whatever it is that you need me to do. And then you get like 60 to 70% of the men and they become the deltas. And they're like the hard workers. They don't want the responsibility of the entire group, but they're there to work and contribute. And that is what makes up 60 to 70% of society. And did you know that women are chasing after the top 5 to 10% of men? You don't even see the rest of them. Now, a gamma, a gamma is kind of like, it's the guy that, he tries to be more like you because he thinks that if he is more like you, 
then you'll like him and you'll let him hit it. But you're intuitively repulsed by him. You can't put your finger on it, but there's something about him that you're just like, nah, I'm good on this. I don't, I'm not feeling this. Like it's the guy you put into a friend zone and who'll be there. And like, you know, when, when your alpha like kind of fucks you over and then the gamma will be the one who'll come over so you can spill your heart out to him and you still say, I still don't want to get with you. And because you feel that, like you feel that there's like a sneakiness. And those are the guys that harm women. Those are the guys that rape women, that, that do bad things to women because they're trying to intellectualize something that alpha men just inherently get. Alpha men just like feel like the vibe between the two of you and like can, can act in a way that's a commanding presence that makes you want him because you're biologically wired for that. So coming back full circle to, is it men that oppress us? Is it the patriarchy that oppresses us? Is it religion that oppresses us? And like, think about how would religion oppress us? Well, I guess you could say because religion tells us to not have sex, like chastity, like the first sin that I I came out the door with. If you guys are not on my newsletter list, get on my newsletter. I'm doing seven days talking about the sins. You get a video land straight to your inbox. So we've already gone through lust. And I chose lust because you come into this world craving desire of love. You lust for love as a baby. That's like your initiation into the world. And then once you have that desire for love, then you're gluttonous and you ask for more and you can never get enough. And you know, if you're a mother and you have a child, that baby can never get enough attention. And sometimes you just need a minute to yourself, but we're gluttonous. Our sinful nature, our tendency is to always want more, never get enough. I can never get enough, never get enough drugs, never get enough alcohol, never get enough food, never get enough dick. So is religion who oppresses us? I think, I think if you, if you look at it again, biology is what oppresses us. And it wasn't until the female revolution, it wasn't until birth control that we could fuck whoever we want, whenever we wanted. <laughs> Let's be honest. Let's talk some truth here. Because that is what this is about. We want to deprogram from the spells of society. Stop spreading lies that the patriarchy is who oppresses us. Stop spreading nonsense that it's religion that oppresses us. Actually, the good fathers and husbands and pastors or priests of society discouraged women from having sex because the repercussions before the revolution was that you would get impregnated by some scumbag that was going to leave you. And now with birth control, with contraceptives and condoms and abortions, you can get rid of the little problem and make it just disappear. And that's what the medical industry has brought in for us, for our good. These are the people that have our best interest at heart. And they put you on birth control so that way your hormones are all out of whack. You don't even know how to connect to your cycle. You don't understand why your emotions are running rampant. And most of all, most of all, You don't even know about your own hypergamy. How many women coaches or or gynecologists or people on mainstream media or in sex ed class or feminists even have talked to you about your hypergamous nature? None. Thank you. I want to hear from you ladies. How did you feel learning about hypergamy? 
like most of the concepts in divine union, um, when I learned about hypergamy, I attributed it to other women. I was like, oh yeah, I see it in other women. Like my best friend who is constantly moving from one guy to the next and it's never good enough for her. And um, it basically perpetual dissatisfaction is what I saw in like all the women around me, my mom, like all the women around me. Um, and so I started attributing it to other women, placing the blame outside of me because that was more comfortable. And then um, it was probably like a month or two, probably more like two or three actually, where it actually hit me that like that's in me and that like my own inability to be satisfied when things aren't just the way I want them to be is founded and rooted in this hypergamous nature. Like I, I was blinded from even seeing it for months until I heard Reem say it enough times. And there was a little bit of irritation for me too, like hearing it like, okay, what all things are just, we can just blame it on our hypergamous nature. Like um, there was just like a little bit of irritation. And then through that and through the blaming other people, I was able to see it in myself. And I think that was so that I could pad that blow a little bit. So it hurt a little bit less. I don't remember how it felt to hear about it. I think the first way I internalized and understood it was like in abundance mindset. My partner's always like, just like, don't worry about waiting till it's on sale. Just get the thing now or whatever. And I'm, it, for me, it was like, oh wait, no hypergamy. Like I love getting a good sale. I love getting the best deal. And so I think I saw it more in like how I approach uh, like shopping basically. And then when it came to like my relationship, it was, I don't think I had like a whole, uh, too much of a like, oh fuck, that's in me moment. Like, I think it was more like recognizing like, oh, that's why it's always like, well, is he it? Or is there another guy who might like look like this or have blue eyes or want to live in Ireland or like, you know, did it, or like all these qualities that like I'm annoyed with and like my partner, you know? And there was less of a like, oh, that's gross about myself. It was more just like, oh, that's why that happens. And knowing that that is just part of me and that might like to a certain extent, just kind of always be a part of me. And I can choose to be aware of it and not like let it derail my entire life. Um, okay, well, I love my partner. I love the life we want to create. And I'm going to like really root down and commit to this instead of being like giving in to that biological instinct of like, oh, but what if there's something else, you know? It's like always, it's like literally around like Black Friday holidays, like the whole thing. It's like, okay, but I want to get this, but what if it goes more on sale? It's like, I don't want to live like that in my relationships all the time. So just being aware of it, it was like, okay, I'm not going to give into that instinct constantly and let that constantly make me second guess what I have, which is pretty good. I also just want to say about the religion piece, um, and maybe this is for a different conversation, but I'm curious what you think, Reem, because my take on how religion is oppressive towards women, it's less to do with telling us not to have sex, and it's more to do with shutting down, like the way Christianity moved through and kind of took over some of the more paganistic type um, mm -hmm. earth-based intuit women intuitive religions that were going on and like came in and was like shutting down of like intuition or like women having a role in these sorts of connections with God. And that's where I mm -hmm. think of it as oppressive. So maybe there's like, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll just touch on that briefly. Um, and we can we can use this for another conversation in the future. But uh, to be totally honest with you that what you see as Christianity now is an inversion of Christianity. Mm -hmm. What happened was everyone assumes that paganism and Christianity were like separate when they were actually more in, deeply connected than we are led on to think. And it was with the uh, massacres in Europe at that time. And um, if you want more information on this, I can direct you to, to that. But when the Catholic Church overtook Christianity as a whole, it was already the what we're seeing today as the uh, demonic, satanic version. And so that's why 
like with this whole massacre of Christians and, and pagans who were deeply, deeply like together in this process because one took the arts and one was in charge of the sciences. And so that was the merging of this like unity in, in the um, European countries. And then this rise of this like, you know, unfortunately evil forces like there's always always in life there's going to be benevolent forces and then evil forces and then that kind of inverted christianity like killed everyone off overtook it and then rebranded itself as religion and so a lot of people that are operating right now that have this like wound or like trauma with religion itself or with christianity in in specific um but like don't know the history and that's ultimately and this is with anything that i say and anything that i teach if you don't know and it's been kept from you or you've been lied to or you've been programmed or you've been deceived whose responsibility is it it's yours it's still your responsibility if everyone is lying to you if you are living in a world of illusion, it's still your responsibility to find what is true and what is false and to develop discernment and discernment. And I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again because I need to drill this in your head. I drill it into my own head every day. It's not the difference between right and wrong. It's the difference between right and almost right. And almost right is a sheep in wolf's clothing, or a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay? And you need to be on watch at all times to see because the infiltration just happens in a second of you not paying attention, of you not being diligent. That's where the sloth comes in. You're lazy. You are spiritually lazy. And think about like everyone loves the third eye. And imagine being spiritually lazy. You don't even have that discernment to determine if this is important, how this would affect you, and allow like your mind and your body and your soul to be infiltrated. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I would say to that. It's a lot of people are operating on trauma, mm -hmm. like traumatic response to religion, kind of like shut everything down. But ultimately, like, if you're triggered by something, we're all, we're all trauma coaches here. We've all like done that, like training. We understand that when you're triggered by something, it's something you have to examine a little bit more. You got to explore it, mm -hmm. you know, like, because if you don't, then there's just work that's piling up. That's undone that you're not examining within yourself like this life is about self-examination and if you don't hold yourself accountable who's holding you accountable and even like we were talking about like going back to the hypergamy and i want to hear from vanya too i really want to hear what was it like for you learning about hypergamy i was fucked up i felt fucked up fucked up and i still felt the needs like in my mind, there is a voice, say, a voice saying right now, Rim, can you tell me again what is exactly hypergamy? Am I really a hypergamist? And yes, and I found myself being hypergamist in relation, relation with men, especially. Like I don't fit so much with sales. I, I, I resonate with Ellen in a way, but totally with men. Yes, and I feel really fucked up. Why do you feel fucked up about it? Uh, because of hypergamy, <laughs> because there is a part of me that keeps saying like, oh, if, if I knew it before, I should do this or that. And I think that there are like thousands of possibilities to me. I, I was thinking that I had really thousands of chance and decision to make, but then I realized that it's not true. And then I was making choice that now I can say like wrong choices because I admit that I did mistakes, lots of mistakes because of that. And, and now it's like, not gonna say a daily meditation, but I think a lot about hypergamy because it's so easy to recognize this in friends and students and family members, but I also have to remember that it comes from me. 
Isn't that interesting how it's so easy to see it in everyone but ourself? No, no. It's a I, really interesting concept too. Yeah, <laughs> but funny, then right? I, for me, it was it's something like, in my experience, when I see these things in other is a, a huge red flag for myself, because I feel that it's already spill over in my life, you know, I don't know if, if that is the right word. But when I see something in others, it's like, okay, Vanya, you're done, we have to work on this a lot. Mm. Does it sound right in English? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just curious, like, what are you doing to work on your hypergamy? And, and maybe, maybe some women don't know what hypergamy is. So let me just give you a frame of reference, because we're just talking about something that you may, may not have ever heard before been introduced to. But hypergamy is you always wanting to get the very best. It's the female imperative, the feminine impulse. So the way that I describe it is, who loves a good sale? I love a good sale. I mean, Evelyn was just talking about how when something goes on sale, we're like, oh, we, we got to get it now. Like it's a, it's a great time to buy. And so what you have as a woman is you have this hypergamous filter, which is always checking in to make sure that you are getting the best possible deal possible. Okay, and now put this in relation into intersexual dynamics, which means how you relate to men. So there's like how women relate to women, how men relate to men, how women relate to men and men relate to women. When you are with a man, there are always two questions that you're asking. The first question is, is he really who he says he is? You just started going out with a guy, gone on a couple of dates. He says all of these things and you're like, is he really that? And you're always giving him these shit tests to make sure that he's who he says he is. Subconsciously, you don't have to consciously engage in this way. You are doing it because on a biological level, psychological, neurological, and physiological, you need to make sure that he is who he says he is because you're afraid of being tricked. Can you give an example that, of the shit test? Yeah. Oh, okay, let me think. Let me think about one that I even do with my husband. Let's see, because that's real, right? I've been married three years and I'm still like, I, as I'm learning this information, I'm able to observe myself in the process and observing the process changes the process. Okay, so, all right, here's one. We, the other day we were driving in the car and we're driving and my husband's really talented. Like he's really gifted. And I know that. That's why I married him. And me knowing that increases my value because he's, he's really that. He really is special. So, he's an artist. And when we meet other people, women don't like to tell me that they find him attractive immediately, but somewhere in the interaction, it kind of comes out because he kind of looks like a better looking version of Leonardo DiCaprio. I'll say it. And, um, and he's way better in bed than what I've heard about Leo. So, <laughs> <laughs> But okay, so we're in the car and he asks me, did those people say anything about me? And I go, what, what are you asking? And he said, oh, did they say that I was like special or something? And I looked at him and I go, do you think you're special? And I, I'm just wondering like what you guys thought he was going to say, just like before I tell you what he said next, just like check in with yourself and say, I think he's going to say this. And based on what you think he's about to say, I want you to ask yourself, does that turn you on more or turn you off? Now, let me tell you what he said. He goes, 
I'm just, I'm just like a normal, I'm just normal. And that pissed me off. He, he failed the shit test. The shit test is he needs to say that like, yeah, of, of like I'm special. And he was like, oh, but I still have work to do on myself. And I'm like, fail, you just failed. Why? Because he is decreasing my value because inherently like this is how we judge ourselves internally you want to get the highest value guy that you can get and if you don't get the highest value guy then you your hypergamous filter feels like it failed because the first question was is he really who he says he is and the second question is is he the best I can get? Mm. Now think about your current partner right now. And how many times have you had a fight and you're like, I could do better than this. I don't deserve what he's doing to me. I deserve better than this. If I just leave him, I can get something better. The grass is always greener on the other side. <clears throat> right? No, my dear, the grass is green where you water it. And you've been filling your heads with nonsense because no other woman is willing to look you in the eye and tell you, you are not getting any younger. Your biology oppresses you. And you need to either find a way to make peace and love the relationship that you're in or st stop wasting time. So... I told him straight up because now our fights have transitioned into intersexual dynamic conversations. <laughs> and I said to him, I'm like, no, that's the wrong answer. And me telling him that inherently will turn me off because guys need to be able to know that there's a game and not reveal the game to you because as soon as they reveal the game to you, they've lost. Or as soon as they fail a shit test, they've lost. Then they can step into a moment of losing frame and you're no longer like craving them or desiring them. And desire and love are ignited in two different parts of the brain. It's not in the same part. So they can both exist and coexist together. But there are things that the man can do that will biologically turn you off because you want the best deal. So ideally, what he would have said in that situation is he would have looked at me and given me like, you know, that kind of, you know, subtle look and been like, I know I'm special. And what would happen inside, I would be like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> Why? <laughs> right? Oh yeah. I would have melted in a moment. And it's sick. It's sick because admitting hypergamy is it's unflattering to women but that doesn't make it less true it doesn't make it less real so hypergamy can be your friend you can know that you are a hypergamous creature and because of that operate in a way that works to your advantage because ultimately divine union is about building yourself in a way that you're acting in the highest accordance with your soul you're in contact with your highest self and you've integrated that so you're in connection with mind body soul you can connect to the divine you can understand what it means not just self-love but selfless love because self-love is an inversion a perversion of like what it means to be human here on earth it's half the story and they're not telling you. The story is to love the other as yourself. And that is where you get unconditional love. You seek love, you give love. You don't go seeking love. You find a way to cultivate love within yourself and offer that as an offering. And then in turn, the cycle, it, it becomes ignited. If you have a block to receiving or giving, you have a block in this energetic circle. And you need to find a way to create some sort of harmony within yourself where there is no block so you can give and receive openly without living in scarcity. 
by understanding true abundance and sourcing that, creating that, being the creator of that. You are the creation of the creator and you have the power to tap into exponential love. But instead, you're lustful. You're lustful in your youthful years and you want to get the best possible guy you can get. Your hypergamy is running unbridled and then you become gluttonous and you want more and he's not giving me enough. And then you become stingy with yourself. I'm not going to give more of myself because I'm drawing boundaries. So you become prideful and you say, you don't deserve me and your ego takes over. We've already hit three sins. How many of you have already lived through this life and experienced every one of those stages? And it doesn't stop there. You become greedy. You want more. And then you become envious because you, the social anxiety kicks in and you start to realize that as you're aging, there's other women landing relationships and for some reason you're not getting the one thing that you want in life which is to be unconditionally loved with a partner that brings you security a man who's going to provide protect and preside over the family and have parental authority if you choose to have children and that envy turns into wrath you become angry and eventually you just become so sloth and lazy and and even us in relationships like over time like how do you stoke the fire how do you like continue igniting the the fire of desire we get lazy and and that's what leads to this perpetual dissatisfaction these these sins are are a way to examine yourself and find how you can like walk the path of straight and narrow to create a life that you love showing up for to like foster a love that you like want to be present for and like want to deepen because you learn to love parts of yourself in the process that you had kind of kept in pandora's box and um it's kind of a gift to like experience all of these things and to play with like the, the sin and then the virtue and being able to like cultivate like, well, I don't want to swing so deep into the rebellion state that I'm like all in sin because ultimately, and you have to ask yourself, what is it that you want most in this life? Do you even do want a divine union? Or do you want to be like all of the single women preaching that you can have it all? You can have your cake and eat it too, sis. Wait, wait all of your fertile years and, and see how you feel. And you'll land the guy of your dreams and keep that perpetual dissatisfaction with everyone in the sexual marketplace because you deserve the best. Do you think you're going to get the best when there's always younger women coming into the sexual marketplace? There's something called the epiphany stage. Men are really, men are really interesting. They've been studying us really well. And like, I have to say, like, this was like gut-wrenching for me to discover this information and um when i first found out about my epiphany stage i was already married i am proof of concept my life is proof of concept you hit your epiphany stage about 28 29 30 where all of a sudden all of the alpha guys that you were so easily attracting, you're not anymore. And now you're kind of realizing you need to lock down somebody as a provisioner. Where are you girls at in your epiphany stage? Have you hit it? I'm in, I'm in mine right now. I'm 28 years old. 
and lots. How are you feeling in it? <laughs> a little, I don't know if overwhelmed is the word, but full. Like there's no like escaping what's happening and the thoughts and the like the consuming nature that it is. It's just like always present. Vanya or Ellen, you want to share? I can share. I'm, can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm 37. I'll be 38 this year. And I'm feeling over. And my feeling is being totally on, on the universe hand, like, I'm feeling like I lost all my chances and I'm not gonna lie to you. Like, I'm not like, yeah, this is gonna come. I'm so happy, just trust. And yes, I'm, I'm over, like over. And sometimes I keep repeating myself like, okay, Vanya, you shouldn't complain. You had at least four big love in your life and you met very handsome men and you have amazing love stories with passion and blah, blah, blah. And yes, but this scares me a lot because I realized too late that I want to have kids and I want to get married. I, not really late, but it, it took a lot of time to, root in, to be rooted in me. And most of all, what I'm feeling now, now is that I cannot talk about these things with my people. Like, I feel like I can share, you know, because everyone is saying like, I want to... They want to see me be like, okay, everything is okay. I'm fine. You know, my life is gorgeous and blah, blah, blah. And that's not true, but I cannot say it. And also I have this feeling, I don't know, Rim, if it ever happened to you, that sometimes like, especially ladies, when they ask you how you feel and then you share, they feel like, okay, I'm so lucky to be here. You know, I don't know if you got what I'm saying, but. Yeah, mm -hmm. but about the allowing myself to receive love, I finally decide after two years to take a puppy with me. So I'm gonna have a puppy and it's something really strange for me and I'm so happy for it. And sometimes I think it's silly because it's only a dog. But then I told to myself, it's a, a huge form of love. And, and my attention is not only on me, but in someone else. Of course, it's not a kid, but it's a, hum it's, a, it's a being, you know? I don't know if you can call it epiphany. <laughs> um, in, your, in regards to your question, Vanya, I think what you're asking about is like, like repentance and regret. And I think that what's really popular to be said nowadays is, I have no regrets. I've done like, I have no regrets because I wouldn't be here where I am now. Yes, in a sense, that's true. But regret, like guilt, like shame, also serve a purpose. And to like repent is to like, to like exist in a space where you can reflect on what happened. And because of your association with the church and because of the distortion of the English language, these words have lost a lot of meaning. And so they become like empty in a way, empty in a sense. And we don't really understand the meaning behind them. And so you hear the word repent and you're like, oh, I'm not going to go tell someone all the things that I've done wrong. But let me ask you, have you ever sat with yourself and told yourself all the things that you've done wrong? against yeah. your end goal yes i did and, and that I was and how to yes i also do with my students sometimes and i also about my teaching path and everyone is like no 
no, because you're such a good teacher. And I'm like, no, guys, I'm like, okay, I can be a good teacher, but I made so many mistakes that I shouldn't be making, you know? And I know that I'm so, sometimes it's a loop thinking about all the mistakes that I made. So I exactly know it feels like heavy in my heart, so heavy. I can start crying right now. <laughs> it's very heavy. Mm. But at least going through a process of admitting can get you to the acceptance. Whereas without it, you have no access to that, right? You just have the grief. Hmm. Right? Yeah. What about you, Ellen? Where are you on your epiphany stage? Have you hit it yet? Are you getting close? What confuses me about it is I've heard you talk about it in terms of it being like 28 to 30, and I'm turning 25 next week, and I've always been in the mode of like gotta find the guy to have the kids with early I'm not gonna be like looking for a guy at 34 35 like and expecting them to like have my family then so when you've talked about epiphany stage I've always actually been kind of confused about how it applies in my life and I still had my rebellion stage and I think right now I'm very much in the mode of like all right I'm, I'm here. Like I'm, I'm in the relationship. I'm in the mode. I'm about to turn 25. Like peak fertility is like about to pass. And so it like right now it is like, all right, like get serious about this shit that I want in my life, which is to have a like harmonious family basically. And so I guess you could say like, I am in it, but it's not that like, whoa, holy shit to me. And maybe there's like more for me to discover as I get older with that phase. But um, I, I just never, I never really was like, oh, I'll just wait like 15 years till I start thinking about having a family. Like every single guy I went on a date with, it was like, all right. And what would you do in this situation with children? And like, you know, <laughs> like not like in a crazy way, but just like the shit test. Yeah. There were the shit tests of like, would you be an ideal father for the family I want to have? I've also been confused about the epiphany stage because it sounds almost like magical in a way, like everything shifts. And like, I've been with my partner for like six and a half years. Um, mm. So for me, I'd like to share what I've been experiencing. And then Reem, you can let me know if this is like falling into that category. Um, so unlike Ellen, I had the opposite where I never really considered the family. Like I knew I might want that one day, even though I couldn't admit it all the way, but I wasn't focused on family or love or locking anything down. But I also wasn't just like sleeping with whoever and just like going really wild, like during my twenties, um, that pretty much stopped at like 21. Um, and so for me, what I've noticed, like it started last year when I was 27, for sure. Um, and that's when I met Reem. And for me, it's been all of the things that I've been collecting during my 20s that I've been trying on that like work for me and love and myself and family and interacting with others. Um, I'm like done with the trying on phase. And now I'm like, does any of this work? And do I want any of this? Like, is this actually what I want? So it's a reevaluation of the things that I spent my 20s trying so hard just to claim something as mine and a belief and what I want and what a career I want and the partner and the family, like, which I spent my 20s searching for. I now have these beliefs and have these things. And now it's like a reevaluation of inventory. Do I actually want this? And is this actually working? Is, is how it's happening now actually aligned with this higher version of me that I see at like 45? <laughs> for some reason, that's the number for me. Yes. So the epiphany stage is you have to think of like, look at your life on like a graph. Okay. And so there's something called the sexual marketplace. It's not about like your value as a woman, like as a human being. It's about your sexual marketplace value, okay? And women peak 
at 23. You're never going to be as hot as you were as when you were 23. And then in, in, um, in different texts, they, they claim that the wall is different ages. So some say 25, some say 20, 29, some say 35. We know, um, like I have interviewed a naturopathic doctor and, and she has explicitly told me that 35 is considered geriatric pregnancy. Now, does that mean that women are still having babies after the age of 35? Absolutely. But your most fertile years are in your 20s and you hit a wall. Let's say your wall is like 25 or 28, whichever one makes you feel good because if I say 25 and you haven't had children, it, this is going to be really triggering, really confronting. And I get it. I, I totally understand. But the epiphany stage, it's like you spend your 20s playing the field. And you're playing the field because, well, this revolution towards uh, equality for females has enabled us. It's given us those crutches that I talked about, you know, the pill, contraceptives, condoms. And essentially, that has allowed us, on one respect, to not have consequences for something that used to be, um, have very, very, like, crazy consequences for. Like, imagine getting impregnated by and I mean, this happens to women still, but now you have an option. Now you have a choice of what you can do with it. Now think of a time in the world where you didn't have a choice. Like your only option was to find like a witch in the woods who's going to help you with some sort of magic potion or like sticking a hanger up your vag and hoping for the best, you know? And so when there's a consequence and consequence isn't always negative it's just cause and effect if you do this you will get that when there's a consequence for your actions you'll think twice before doing the thing when there's no consequences then you just go with what feels good you follow your desire and you follow your pleasure and that is what helps you to pick Mr. Right now instead of Mr. Right. Okay. You play the field in your 20s and at about 28 or 29, you hit the epiphany stage. So Ellen is not in her epiphany stage yet, even though she's always had this like deep impulse to settle down and settling is different than settling down. But she's always had this desire to find someone. And I know Ellen personally, and she mentioned on the call that she didn't have a positive masculine role model in her life. And so part of that in her derives from not having security in a father figure. And so she is wanting to lock that down. And that's proof of concept. So Mackenzie is about to hit her epiphany stage. Mackenzie's 28. So what's going to shift for her in the next year or so is that her body is going to say, hey, pay attention. We need to start having babies soon. We need to lock down a guy who can be a parental authority or a provisioner, a provider. The male imperative is to provide, protect, preside. Men want to protect women. Men, like there are studies and, and even um, many experiences that show that even if, if she's a stranger and there's a gun being shot, a man will put himself between the woman and the bullet, not even knowing the woman. Because there is this male impulse, this imperative to protect. So as, as McKinsey goes into this next year, somewhere in her biological wiring, her hardware is her physical body, her software is the cultural programming, and her firmware is going to be her feminine nature. And somewhere in her wiring, she is going to get like, like 
warning sign, warning sign, beep, beep. You need to settle down. You need to like lock down the person that you're with. Now she's already in a long-term relationship. So her hypergamy is going to be going off in the background being like, is this the guy? Is this the guy? Okay. If this is the guy, we need to like seal the deal. And that's what you're going through right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, and now that you say that, that makes so much more sense. Cause like, I've looked at my relationship this, I say year as in like the last 12 months, um, with a freaking magnifying glass where I'm looking at everything and evaluating, like, is this working for me? And like, thank God for learning the divine union, because if not, like I was definitely slipping down and it feels like a weaker mindset to like allow the hypergamous nature to take over because like, there's, there's nothing like grounding about it. It's, um, it feels very, um, flailing I'll say. Um, and so, yeah, the, especially this, this last like couple months, like I've been definitely going through this like reevaluation of my current relationship and my current partner and my own actions as well. And that's what I meant by like, um, I'm reevaluating everything is our dynamic and the way that we're going about having this union is there a union here? Is it divine? Like, and that's, and that's scary. Cause once you start looking at that, um, there's so much that you could just, there's, it's so easy to just say like, well, it would be easier to find someone who hits all my check marks, but it's like what I've cultivated for the last six and a half years is way more valuable then throwing that aside so that I feel more comfortable, I don't know, being like weighted and doted on whatever that hypergamous, hypergamous nature wants. Um, so I'm very grateful for this. And men peak at 36. And so why this information has become so important, like for me to share? Well, number one, since integrating this content, my marriage has just it's like we're just in such a better place because I believe the narrative that I don't know like I guess on some level on some really subtle level because of I, I identified as a feminist and so on some level I thought that even though we were fighting for equality I was kind of better than my husband because of all the things that I could do more than him like I'm always like juggling so much and I kind of subconsciously like didn't value him as much as I could have in this process and kind of was like, well, like I was carrying the baby and I gave birth to the baby and I'm breastfeeding and you just don't know how hard this is and, and totally ignoring all of the signs that he's like everything that he's doing to help cultivate this like this partnership because ultimately we can't both be doing the same role we have to find a way to be compatible and not just compatible but complementary so men and women are not equal we're complementary to one another and the sooner that you can have an awareness to this and then figure out how to tap into his things that he really excels at and your things that you really excel at and find a way to like mesh that together. You're always going to be playing in this power struggle. And ultimately you don't want to be in power. Ultimately you want to be led because that is the feminine way because you're flowy and you're free and you just want to like, you just are men have to become women just are are and men have to become and so when you're pre-wall years or pre-epiphany years you have a chance to lock down someone that is gonna grow into a much more mature um, and high value being and you can learn to crush together and if your 
post wall, post epiphany, even post like having a baby pregnancy years, then you have to really evaluate what it is that you want. Do you want a divine union and integrate these um, teachings in a way that they become so internalized that you understand why men are, are the way that they are and why women are the way that they are and why you've done what you've done to then shift into a state where you're like, okay, I want to change the trajectory of my life because if I don't get a grip over what's happening, I'm going to have, I'm going to be left with nothing. Because men are telling other men these teachings and telling them, don't play. Don't engage. Just pull out. The risk is too high and the reward is too low. There, men are telling other men that we live in a femme-centered world, a gynocentric society, and in a way, they're not wrong because there is, in the West, a serious demasculinization of men. Men are becoming more feminized because what is being said across the board is that be more like women. If you're more like women, then women will want to sleep with you. And that's just not true. Women want to sleep with masculine men, not feminine men. It's very, it's very simple. And we've, be, we've taken a role of masculinization as women. And now we want to take the power and the responsibility. And then when it doesn't suit us, we say, hold on, wait, 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 where are the good men? Now you guys take responsibility. Where are all the good men now? Well, you either left them back in your 20s or you told them that their masculinity was toxic and now they don't know how to man up. So what can we do to shift this narrative? Because there's like black pill who are like nihilists who are like, don't engage with women. Don't even go there. Don't even sleep with them. Just like, like society is done. We're all going to die. It's over. And then there's MGTOW, who is like men going their own way, who are like, don't engage with women because the court system is rigged to always support the female. And I know many people will have a discrepancy with me saying that, but you can study that on your own or join Divine Union and learn all about why they think that. Because we're not about straw handing here, straw manning, excuse me, here. We're about steel manning. And if you don't know the difference, straw manning is like hearing something and trying to pick it apart. Steel manning is understanding what is being said and being able to articulate it in a way that that individual would even say so. So I'm trying to understand why are these men saying this to other men? Why are they telling the younger generations of men to withdraw from engaging with women and who benefits from this and who loses from this. What happens if men stop engaging with women? Then society ceases to exist. If men and women don't do this dance that they've done for all of eternity, where we like, he tries to woo her and she falls in love and they make a story and then they have children and da 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 da. If they don't, if they stop doing this, then humanity will no longer exist. Again, unless we're all reverting to test two babies. And this is a real, like, <laughs> it's a real spiritual study. But we look at it from a practical application. And we need to start really assessing what kind of a role we are playing in this and co-creating in this reality and really understanding. Um, and so, yeah, so then you have MGTOW and then you have the guys that are just like, just fuck women and don't lock them down, you know? And so you need to really assess where you are on the spectrum. Do you have a good partner? If you have a good partner, are you showing him your appreciation 
and your gratitude for all that he's doing for you? Are you miserable? Are you perpetually dissatisfied? Whether you're single or in a relationship, what is the root of your perpetual dissatisfaction? Who are you at the end of the road? When you look at the end of your life and the journey that you've taken, who is it that you want to be? Is what you're doing in your day-to-day -day moments contributing in a positive or a negative way to that end result? And these are just some of the few questions that we discuss in Divine Me. How are you feeling, ladies? I feel like every time we talk about this stuff, just like even watching your faces, I'm like, I see you getting it more and more and like understanding what the magnitude of this information is. Yeah, I had a click moment today. I'd love to share. Um, so when you talk about men, we want men and healthy masculinity is a man who presides, protects, provides. Um, and that's ultimately at a biological level what we want. And I think even at like a lustful Mr. Right, whatever level, like that's that's kind of what people want. But then there's the whole, um, I guess, essentially feminist programming of like, fuck the patriarchy, fuck that, you can't control me. And I just was reflecting on this in my own relationship throughout this conversation. And we've been having, um, just throughout our relationship, there's a lot, he's very, very diligent about like health and toxicities in our environment. And my attitude towards that, like I shared at the beginning is all like, okay, like whatever, like, it's not a big deal. Oh, get away like that. <laughs> and, um, but then I like incorporate the changes and I'm so much healthier for it. And the latest thing we've been doing in our home is I got him a little EMF detection gadget. And it, like, it's so funny. He's like running around the house with it, like having like a kid with a toy. Um, but now it's like, he knows like the room I'm sitting in right now is like the worst room. I feel like shit being in this room on phone calls all the time. I'm not in the other rooms because we're switching all of our furniture around to be in like, to be able to sleep in like the spot where we're least bombarded by EMFs. And my attitude was like, all right, do what you got to do. Like, that's fine. That sounds fun. Like, this sounds like a better arrangement for our, how we live anyway. But still in my head, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Judgment, judgment, like, oh, whatever. Like, I've learned not to resist it as much. But like, during this conversation, I was like, wait a minute, he's protecting. Like, we aren't living in the woods with like a bear about to eat us. But even with that, he's like, diligently watching his videos of how to like shoot a bear if that happened but like he's protecting against like what are our modern attacks on our humanity essentially and I have been like judging it and shit testing it and rebelling against the very thing that I want because I'm seeing him protecting as him trying to control me and I'm just like like I'm like I feel like my whole body is like electric right now and like I want to cry and I want to go hug him and I want to be like thank you and I'm so sorry and like da 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 for like being a brat and being like you can't control me and like why do we have to do all this ridiculous stuff all the time and like oh it's so annoying when it's like no he's protecting us against like what he what he views essentially is like what are the modern day threats and he's not wrong I've had a headache this entire time sitting in this room which is connected to all the smart meters for our freaking building and like is like loaded with like shit that's bad for us, you know? So um, I just wanted to share that because that's like, that's so what divine union is, is like this stuff constantly hitting and you hear it so many times. I've heard it for months. You say like they're protecting, they're presiding that like they got to let them do that. We've labeled that as toxic masculinity. I'm like, oh yeah, that's true. Da, da, da. And then it's, it just like hits and you just feel it in your whole body. And it's like, oh fuck I've been doing that to my partner and like that's shitty and I gotta go own up to that after this and it doesn't feel good but then it gets a lot better after that so for me where this is landing um I'm just seeing like talking bringing it back to those seven deadly sins like I'm seeing that progression um 
not only just over my life and applying to myself, but in my own relationship, since it has been so long-term, like I've literally, and I love the way you laid them out too, in the particular order, because I, before we got on the call, like I made a list of them and they're in order. And so I've been staring at them and I can see myself in different stages in this relationship going through these sins and they either I was able to um like overcome them in a way where they weren't such like I don't have them all as a problem now but I definitely see like where I ended up and where I ended up like honestly before we started divine union so like right when I was in Oregon back um last summer um I ended up in sloth, like kind of just giving up and just being like, well, this is my life. And um, like accepting that or like placing blame on other people and just kind of like admitting like this is just like my life or whatever. And um, Reem mentioned before the call that the opposite of sloth is diligence and um, like diligence is that tending to the garden and like cultivating that whatever whatever it is that you want to grow and so it's like even in my slothfulness I have been diligent in cultivating something and like what is that something and so even if I'm saying all this because I'm realizing like even if you want to write this off and say like this doesn't apply to me or whatever it's like you're always cultivating something you're like you said the other day you're always feeding one wolf like there's two wolves like which one are you feeding you're always going to be feeding one or the other um so really taking a a look at myself and my relationship and um figuring out in each moment where you can turn those sins into their virtues I love that you just said that to Mackenzie, like that was just so like present in my body, even just if you're not feeding love, you're feeding hate. It's so simple. Always. You're making a choice in every moment. You're feeding one or the other. What about you, Vanya? How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm not going to lie you. I feel very bad. I feel sad. Very sad. Yeah. But you know me, like it's it's like this all the time. And while you're talking, I'm questioning it a lot about my karma and my dharma also, even though I'm not like really into that. It's not the all of my vision. I'm not only locked into dharma or karma, but I'm thinking a lot about that. And I'm, yeah, it's, I'm also asking myself why all these conversations are taking place in my life nowadays, because I'm trying to feed a lot of love in my life. I try to like infuse love in everything I'm doing. And yes, so I'm thinking a lot about my life. <laughs> Thank you for being honest and vulnerable. And I just want to say to you and any other women out there who are listening, who feel really hopeless after this conversation because that's that's really not the intention and although it may be a byproduct please understand that's not the intention but i said it in the beginning of the conversation observing the process changes the process rollo tomasi said that and i really like want you to think about like what could you do now because it's the We've talked about the what, we've talked about the so what, but now what? Now what can we do with this information? And observing the process changes the process. By you knowing this information, you can change what's happening. By knowing your biology, by knowing your impulses, by knowing the why behind your impulses, you can choose a different future. And you can create something that you actually want. And so this is not to make you feel hopeless. This should bring you hopeful. 
And so um, I just want to reiterate that because it's easy to get lost in, in, in the darkness of this, but it's knowing how to balance the two and understanding what can I do now that this information is empowering, you know, really assessing what are my non-negotiables and what, what are the things that I thought were my non-negotiables that I could probably change, tweak, or bend a little bit. And it doesn't have to be about something really fundamental, but maybe if you're one of those women who's only looking at the top 5 to 10% of men, maybe expand your horizons a little bit. Or maybe you have someone in your life that you're kind of like, eh, but he just doesn't do it for me. Figure out what it is about that person that just doesn't do it for you. And ask yourself, do you think that you check off all of his boxes? And maybe he's making some compromises for you too. And this is just a great time for self-reflection, you know? It shouldn't just be on these one-time, one-off consumer holidays or when the society or the world tells you to reflect on yourself. You should be in a constant process of self-reflection, learning, and growing. And so learning to source love within ourself, learning to connect with our womb space and understand that that is the center of our body as women. This is what I teach um, in, in divine union, in pelvic redemption, is understanding the power of woman and what it means to be a woman and what it means to be in harmonious nature with your femininity and how to cultivate a presence of union with, with the masculine as well. So I just want to go ahead and briefly mention um, the virtues, but um, if you hadn't had a chance to connect with us, um, connect with me in my live calls, um, I've already hit lust and gluttony, and tonight at 9 p.m. EST, we're going through vanity. And so you can just take a second and kind of sit back while I just briefly brush over these virtues that maybe you didn't consider and some of them may be confronting but it's something to think about so lust the virtue for lust is chastity for gluttony it's temperance for pride or vanity it's humility for greed, charity, for envy, well, the sources say kindness, but I think it's more than that. I would have to say that envy would be, the virtue of envy would be to like wish everyone like to be grateful that they are deserving of that, to be grateful that they have access to that. So I think kindness to me falls slightly short, but you can decide for yourself. For wrath, it's patience. And for sloth, diligence. And so ask yourself, of all of these words, where in your body did you get like a signal where you're like, ah? <laughs> Might be something you want to explore deeper. Might be something you want to consider looking at. And so I want to thank everyone for being on the call today. So if you have not checked out the link in my profile, Again, my name is Reem, and I go by the Pasa Mama. Um, the link to Divine Union, uh, we are still in launch mode until Valentine's Day at 11.59 p.m. EST. So you still have a chance to 
read the offer page. And if you haven't read it, at the very least, go give it a read through because you will learn so much. If you learned anything in this call, please like, share, comment on this video. Um, send it to someone that you think could benefit from this. This information is invaluable and it might make the difference in someone's life. And so I want to thank everyone for being on the call. I really want to just thank Mackenzie and Vanya and Ellen. And I want to announce that this is the first of many conversations. And um, so you'll get to hear more from these women and we'll be featuring other women on these calls. So this is a new segment that we're going to be uh, incorporating. And um, yeah, just we're really excited for this. We're really excited to pose these hard topics and questions and give our two cents on what women think and who women are. And yeah, um, I want to just save space if there are any questions. You can type them in the chat or um, raise your hand or something. And just really, really grateful for everyone being here today. So again, please, I know you have at least three girlfriends that you could send this video to. And I just want you to think about like who you were coming into this call. You had no idea what to expect. You definitely didn't anticipate what it is that we did talk about. And so please send this to this person or these women that you know, because they could benefit tremendously. And I think one of the coolest things that has come out of Divine Union, I just have to say, is the friendships that are being fostered in this space. Because, I mean, <laughs> I've gotten to watch these women grow. Um, I, I myself am growing in this process. It's very painful. I, I don't claim to, to say that this has been really easy for me, even from a teaching perspective. And because as a teacher, you can't just, you don't teach from like a place of all knowing, you're also learning in the process. And so we're constantly internalizing and integrating. And um, yes, so please, I'm going to encourage you all to follow each one of these women and all of their handles are going to be posted on the video on Instagram. And so you can please follow, please like, please comment, please share. This really helps. If you like this type of content, this helps other people have access to it. So don't be stingy. Share. <laughs> And um, let us know. Let us know if you have any questions. Drop the questions in the comment box below. And men, share this too with women that you think would benefit from this because we are starting to cultivate critical thought around what the mainstream culture has fed to us. And yeah, um, let's, let's be in full responsibility for ourselves. Let's take that action and stop waiting on someone else to do that instead. So thank you all women, if you have anything to share before we close off. All good, awesome. All right, ladies, I will see you tonight. Please join me live 9 p.m. EST. Go check out my YouTube. I'm gonna put this up on YouTube. You can watch a more professional version than shit Instagram <laughs> but no thank you Instagram you also serve a purpose and really grateful for all of the connections that I've made on here and all the people that I can all the audience that we can reach so thank you actually for that but I know you got a censorship problem so <laughs> so it's a fact so thank you so much ladies and um if any of y'all don't have any questions we'll sign off and I'll see you later and sign up for my newsletter. It's free. It costs you nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs>